I've known about the center of gravity indicator for a long time, but it always to me was this version right here. Turns out there is another version. It's a John Ehlers version and we can actually use it. So let's check it out. Now more specifically, the version you saw in that very first slide, I think it was called the Bakayate Center of Gravity Indicator, if I'm saying it right, spelled B-A-K-H-A-Y-T-E. So if you really are interested in seeing something like that, feel free. Um, but I don't have any use for indicators like that. But I do have a use for indicators like we are about to see with the center of gravity. Now if you're new, Understand that a lot of what you see is not going to make a lot of sense, um, but if you like trading with indicators and you want to do it this way, this is the channel for indicator trading. So go to nonsenseforex.com, watch that first video, read that first page, and you will be well on your way. Now for the rest of us, let's not get into the center of gravity indicator just yet because we have some unfinished business with last week's video with the Vulcan Profit Indicator. Now we had a few different groups of people come in the comments section. Uh, some people were saying, hey, this is my confirmation indicator. Wow, you know, we're finally going over it. This is really cool. So we've had people that have used this for a, you know, a meaningful amount of time. And then we had another group of people that came in and said, hey, I am noticing that this indicator repaints. And we certainly don't want to use repainting indicators at any point in time um, because you're not getting accurate results. And worse than that, you're getting false signals. Um, so we needed to do a little bit more digging. Now, Dan was able to find out something very interesting that we all need to see real quick because we're, gonna, we're going to encounter everybody who does indicator trading is going to encounter repainters at some point in time. And you need to be able to not only identify them, but understand that they come in a few different forms. And this is a great example right here. So we're going to go to a video that Dan made and has put up on his YouTube channel and I think on his blog. And it's going to illustrate exactly what I'm talking about. So let's go there now. Okay, so what I'm going to do here is let Dan's video run, and then I will comment where I feel like there needs to be a comment. Discovered. There were comments about this indicator repainting. However, it did not present in the usual way. That being said, we decided to do a little further investigating due to a few discrepancies we'll discuss and demonstrate in the short video. By the way, we undertook a search for a non-repainting version of the indicator and found three instances. We downloaded them, placed them on the charts, and discovered that all three still showed signs of sporadic repainting of the arrows. But the catch was, they were repainting in different places. That being said, we made a screen recording over a period of eight hours on the one minute chart to determine how and when the indicator repainted. I'll start up the video and increase the speed by 25,000%. When it begins, you'll see three pre-existing signals. Now, we'll begin to see live signals popping up, three to be exact. Notice that signals are drawn and do not repaint. I'll skip over a period which did not return any signals, then resume tracking. Notice that the signals which have been printing do not redraw and remain in the same place. We'll skip ahead a bit. Now look about one third from the left side of your screen and you'll see a red arrow appear, approximately 55 to 60 periods prior to current price. All right, now it's about to get good. There we go. Here's a close up of the before and after. Did you guys see it? Notice the new signal, but it means nothing because it's so far in the past, unless you're back testing. It was this one right here. So let's resume. And let's skip ahead a bit. Now watch closely, and you'll see a blue arrow pop up after prices move past that point in time. right there. 
so here's the thing. This is really weird because we've never done an arrow indicator on the indicator profile series up until last week. And so I can't go back and see the data for this. Like if this is a two lines cross, for example, I can go back and see what was going on with the data, but I can't do it here. It's just either the arrow pops up or it doesn't. Uh, but my point is, let's say you're here in time, like this is what's going on right now, and you have this random arrow pop up back here. It doesn't mean anything. You understand? It has nothing to do with anything. It just popped up. It's irritating. It makes you second guess things a little bit. The one thing you don't want is these actual signals that you got in real time. You don't want those changing. You don't want this arrow to disappear. You don't want this arrow to move from here to maybe over here because that means there was some data changing in the past. So like if this was a two lines crossed, let's say you got a signal right here, two lines crossed, but all of a sudden as time went on, they didn't cross here anymore and they crossed here, you have a big problem on your hands now. You have a repainter that you don't want. But if you have something like this going on, it's weird, but it's inconsequential. I'll explain more later. I'll let Dan, Dan kind of run this out so you can see the rest. Did you see it? Once the new arrow popped up, it stayed there along with the arrows which appeared organically. And the organic ones are what you want to pay attention to because those are your actual signals. Over the span of eight hours, there were 14 signals which did not move or repaint and two which painted after price had moved well past that point in time. So what does this tell us? It tells us that had you used this indicator, you could have entered and exited a trade long before the false arrows popped up. And even if you did, um, and even if those arrows did pop up while you were still in the middle of a trade, it wouldn't matter. It's the organic signals you're actually concerned with. So there was a little more to this video. You can go watch it on YouTube or Dan's blog if you want to. Um, but let's get out of here and I'll, I'll go back to my slide deck and we'll kind of sum this up real quick. So to sum this up, you know, is there a new term out there? You know, are, there, are repainters the bad ones that actually mess with the signal you took? Or is this more of just a little annoyance to where arrows come in after the fact, but they're completely inconsequential because you've already taken the signals you're supposed to take? I don't know the terminology. I've never encountered anything like this before, but it's interesting to be able to you know, have all of us go over this in real time and figure out what the best course of action is. Now, Again, these arrows do not appear to affect actual trading at all. You know, they're going to pop up and the trader's going to be like, what the hell's going on? But it seems like you can just simply ignore them because, like I said, they appear to be inconsequential. Also, if you do automated backtesting, if you use the MT4 strategy tester or any other type of backtesting software, this shouldn't even mess with that. This should not affect the results of backtesting either. You know, one of the telltale signs that you might have a repainter on your hands is if the default version of it just performs spectacularly across the board. Now, with the Vulcan Profit, it did really well on Bitcoin, but it actually underperformed quite a bit on the other ones, which immediately made me think, okay, this something's not right here. We got a lot of people calling this a repainter, but if it did repaint, you, th you would think it would perform a lot better than it has. And I think this is the reason why, because the things that you are seeing repaint don't really have any type of weight in trading or backtesting. So, and I'm very cautious when I say this, I feel like the results that we showed were actually accurate and it looks like this indicator is safe to use. And if you've been using it, I would say go ahead and keep using it. Now, my question to the community is, are you seeing something that we're not seeing? You know, we do the best we can. We nail it most of the time, but this, you know, at the end of the day, we're only two people. This is where the community comes in. I am completely okay with being wrong here if it means that we can keep people away from using an actual repainter to where the actual signals you get 
end up moving over time from one location to another. That is what you absolutely don't want for obvious reasons. But again, if you're seeing something we're not, feel free to put it down below in the comment section. Every once in a while, we'll have some random person come into a random video I do and say, this is a repainter, and it's totally not. Like, I've used it. I know it's not. Um, but you guys who chimed in last week, uh, I know a lot of you. I've seen a lot of you post in the past. You're pretty observant, so we want your feedback on this as well. Because God forbid anybody takes a repainter all the way through the back testing and the forward testing phase and into the real money phase, that would be uh, highly unlikely. Um, you'd have to be pretty unobservant to, to do that, but it would be awfully disastrous if you were actually using that with real money or a prop firm or something like that. So sorry to take up a lot of this video's time on something like this, but I think we can all agree this is pretty important and this was a, a very unusual situation and we need to be able to recognize it and be able to draw a conclusion on it as well as a community. So moving on to the actual center of gravity, let's go over the specs here. Uh, the year is going to be 2002. Uh, again, John Ellers did this one, and I, we've gone over his indicators in the past, and this fits well within our 1996 and on threshold. This is going to be a zero cross. It originally wasn't, but as we have done before on the show, um, and as you have probably done in the past too, you can make these better just by making them a different type of confirmation indicator. So the subtype is going to not really be anything. It's just a zero cross. And as far as exits go, I don't love it. Um, but again, feel free to test it if you want to. So let's take a look at the John Ellers center of gravity indicator in its original form. Now, I've seen versions that have this zero line. I've seen versions that haven't. But this is going to be a two lines cross indicator at its heart. Now, so you see what's going on. The red line is your faster line of the two. It is your signal line. So anytime it crosses and closes beyond the blue downward, that's a short. And conversely, when it crosses up and closes above the blue, that's going to be a long. Now the problem with this, and I'm just clipping and ripping these from Dan's blog, is uh, I don't know if you've noticed offhand just with your two eyes, but this gives you a lot of signals, <laughs> way too many, actually. Whenever you see these rings connect, you almost certainly have a bad signal and a losing trade. So what we did, or what Dan did, let's go back to the original here, is he kept the zero line, but then all he did was eliminate one of these two lines and use the remaining one as your zero cross signal line. Now, as a rule, what's always worked better for me is taking the slower of the two and using it. Uh, because worst comes to worst, I can always use it as a secondary confirmation indicator. So the slower one in this case would be the blue. Um, but Dan found it better to use the faster of the two lines, which is the red. So you end up with this. And this is what we will be testing today. So for those who don't know, when the red line crosses and closes above that zero line, that's going to be your long. And then when it goes the other way and crosses and closes below, that is going to be your short. Pretty simple. And you will notice this time around, we have a lot fewer trades than we did before. And this is obviously a good thing. Now, we still have a couple bad ones there connected to each other. Um, but this is where you would hope your algorithm would come in and eliminate as many of those as possible. So it just goes to show, again, don't do what 2012 VP would always do and dismiss indicators that didn't work really well. It didn't look like they worked really well. If you can find a way to make them work better, then do that because we actually came across something decent here. Now, speaking of that, let's go ahead and test. Now, before we do understand, these tests mean nothing in the grand scheme of things. It all matters on how they do in your system and what results you get. So make sure you're doing that. And then also know that in, in the links below, you're going to get a link to the blog on how to test this yourself. Um, it's on my automation blog. It's in the middle somewhere. It's Dan's video. Uh, you're going to get a link to the actual blog for this indicator, showing you all the tweak settings, showing you all the, uh, the mathematics in the background, all that kind of stuff. You will also get Dan's second email address that if you want to submit your own indicators or if you have questions on any of the ones we've gone over so far, this is where you would go for questions like that. And then a link to where you can download this yourself. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into these. On the euro dollar, not spectacular, but pretty good after the tweaks and with a healthy amount of trades 
as well, in my opinion. Certainly did better on the four hour than it did on the one year on the daily chart, but uh, but still, that's not the worst, you know. And you can improve on that quite a bit with an algorithm. So anytime you see numbers like this, don't just say, "Oh, you know, I'm I'm going to skip this one because the one last week had 12 percent." And that's a mistake. You know, you should still try these out. And now, before we move over to gold, there, there's construction going on inside of my building, and that mixed with the police sirens, I'm not sure how much of it my microphone is picking up. I hope it's not too distracting. Uh, I do not, I did not move to a war zone, if anybody's asking, but all the noise I do get does seem to come when I'm shooting, for whatever it's worth. Uh, but let's go on to gold, and you're going to see a bit better results here, consistency-wise. Again, I like personally, I like these amount of trades after the tweaks, and that's not bad or I to start. Not bad at all. Over to the S&P. Uh, maybe less impressive, but again, the S&P gives you, what, 11% every year? And people get paid a lot of money just to beat that. And you're already starting here. That's not bad. Now, I don't love this, personally, but if you trade multiple indices, that this could, then this could work. Uh, moving over to Bitcoin, I think this was much better. It is. Yeah, good starting places. Decent amount of total trades. If you're only a Bitcoin trader, you're not going to like that too much. Um, but if you trade, you know, plenty of other pairs, then I think this would fit in pretty nicely. Actually, those are those are strong numbers, for sure. So we hope you enjoyed the center of gravity indicator, at least this version, and got a little more clarity on last week's video. And just so you know, indicators are what we do here, man. Subscribe, hit the bell. We keep going. We have a trading psychology podcast every Monday. Indicator videos every Wednesday, a blog every Thursday, and an investing podcast every Saturday. This is your one-stop shop for all things trading and investing. We're not stopping. Neither are you. Go get it.